Welcome back to the Empire Never Ended. We are continuing our uh, SOPO coverage here with Boris, Fritz, and Ray. Yo. Hey. And finally getting to who I hope will become a podcast favorite, um, which is... uh, (laughs) Which is which is Kavaya. What's his first name? Nikola. Right? Nikola. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Nikola Kavaya. The. Uh, I mean, this is one of the stories that we've been sitting on for a while. It's yes. It's out of it's one of the crazier guys that we've talked oh, about, which yeah. says a lot. I mean, he, he's we've covered some crazy ass people, but he's like on a different level of just um, Nuts, alcoholism, yeah. violence. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the whole deep state shit, everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I'm reading his autobiography, and the whole time I'm having like kind of Martin Scorsese movies kind of flashbacks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh-huh. and, um, yeah, a very violent man. Um, although this is like his his autobiography where he's, I guess, presenting himself in a good light. Oh, um, which is like. Gr- Growing up on the streets of Yugoslavia wasn't easy. Uh, I killed uh, a man when I was 11 years old. Uh, well, well, is he Toyota or is he Pesci? <laughs> I, I don't know what he is. Like, uh, this is like a whole other thing. Like, I, I think Scorsese might actually want to look into, into this autobiography. Yeah. He, w- he would be inspired. Around? Yeah. He is, yeah. You mentioned he he's like uh, Luca, Luca, uh, what, Luca Brazzi. Is it Brazzi or Brassi? I think Brazzi. I don't know. Yeah, that's a Godfather character. Godfather guy, yeah, yeah. He, uh, Nikola Kovaya definitely has that vibe, but I think that's also partially to, you know, being a demented alcoholic in his late days. Like, Uh I I don't, I don't think he was like that his whole life. (laughs) Uh, Also, there's like, as you will see, like, okay, we are, (laughs) basically, he tried to escape uh, Yugoslavia the first time in 1953 when he was 20. And, you know, so most of this journey today, he's in his 20s. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, he, he didn't even drink, like, at the beginning. Oh, wow. Uh, according to him. I don't know. Well, um, what does that mean? Like, drinking to, like, a 20-year-old Yugoslav could mean, like, I, whatever. I wasn't passed out every day. I mean. No, I'm apparently sure he... he didn't drink alcohol. And then Whoa. suddenly, at some point, he's drinking, yeah. Well, damn, he went real downhill in his later years, though. I've oh, seen, yeah. I've seen yeah. that. Sh- oh, yes. I've seen those interviews. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and also, like, uh, a, a head trauma, I think, is a big part of this. Oh, story. sure. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Like, lots of that in this episode. Lots. People describe um, him as having his, like, face all bashed in or something, or his, like, uh, no, maybe, like a boxer's know. nose or something like Possibly, that. Possibly, like yeah. A face that's seen some physical trauma. Mm, yes. He's seen mm-hmm. a lot of shit, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went. So I'm reading his autobiography, which the title is "Sons of Betrayed Serbia." Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't think it's available in um, in English. And I went through 200 of the 600 pages with the idea, okay, this will be one episode, but I think it will be more than that. So I don't know in okay. the end how many of Kavai episodes we'll, we will have. He doesn't say uh, everything about his life here. Uh, he was more honest in his later drunken interviews. Mm. Uh, so this is why we'll de- do an, uh, a reenactment of, of one of those for our premium episode, uh, <laughs> the next one. And Excellent. There you, there you will get some things that he doesn't say here, you know, okay. uh, about, right. about his early life. God, I'm trying to figure out which pun to pick for Sons of Betrayed Serbia. I mean, is it a, is it a sob story or... Is this the other SOBs? It's just, where do you go with <laughs> <Yes>. that? <laughs> I'll, I'll think about yeah. it for a while. Come back to me later. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, yes. Um, you sons of betrayed Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so, Nikola Kavaya was born in Pech, the uh, town in Kosovo, in 1933. And uh, he's of Montenegrin origin. He's like all he all claims throughout of this book that he's a Montenegrin Serb all the time. That's how he mm. defined himself. So, but okay. So his last name is a bit weird, and um, because like that's a name of a place in Albania, uh, Kavaya. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a, uh huh. It's a resort town now, like a yeah. Beach and resort town. I think our Nicola feels a little bit insecure about this, and oh. uh, that uh, that. <laughs> 
that he's like Ser- Serbhood is, you know, sometimes questioned because he's named mm. after an Albanian place. Um, yeah, like that guy also, in the order named Martinez. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Uh, he also, you know, was born in Kosovo where many Albanians live and has like some, his family history is tied to Albanian different ways. Like, he's one of the, so the idea that he has this uh, last name is that one of his ancestors were, was kind of banished from, uh, because I, I think of murdering someone or someone, someone like this. So, so All right. he was hi- hiding in that place in Albania. So when he came back to Montenegro, they were calling him like, uh, because he was living there by the name mm-hmm. of that town. So that's one idea. But, you know, like a lot of these, because in Montenegro, you still had, and to some degree, still have this kind of clan structure. Yeah. Um, this, uh, uh, there is some kind of consciousness of, you know, different families belonging to specific clans. And you have the same thing in Albania. And in the oral history of these clans, you have some consciousness that some of these clans from Albania and clans from Montenegro are related to each other uh-huh. and are relatives. Uh, so there's also that thing, uh, um, you know, so, yeah. Although one, you know, n- nation, let's say, is of Slavic origin, the other isn't, there was some kind of cultural connection between them. And culturally, a lot of, lots of them are pretty close to each other, I would say. Right. You know, during the Second World War, both his father and his two older brothers were in the partisans. And I think that even, I think that one of his brothers, at least one, was well, maybe even the father and uh, the other brother. I'm not sure about them, but one brother for sure. I think was with the, with the Albanian partisans, actually. Oh, oh wow. wow! Okay. But he, you know, Nikola was younger, so he stayed home with his mother. And because they lived in Kosovo, when Yugoslavia was occupied, uh, Kosovo became a part of the sort of Greater Albania, which was like an Italian puppet state. Yeah. So as Serbs, they were arrested and sent to a like a, a camp. Um, in Albania, where they were used basically as a kind of, um, you know, slaves, basically, and uh, were building uh, infrastructure in Albania, like roads and some um, military uh, infrastructure and bridges and so on. And he says that, you know, they were treated badly, the food was gross and like not a lot of it and so on. Mm -hmm. But when Italy capitulated, uh, now, this is him talking, you know, many years later. He says, like, because of, you know, the, the Serbian Quisling Milan Nedic that we talked about kind of insisted that these Serbs should be returned to Serbia. So they were transferred from, you know, these camps in Albania to Serbia proper, which was, you know, this kind of Nazi puppet state controlled by mm-hmm. the Germans, uh, which they had, like, better world life conditions and so on. And, you know, after the liberation of the country, when the Soviet, like, Red Army came and the partisans, his brother, the partisan, who was kind of well-regarded in the partisan movement, came there. And so he says, like, we, there were no uh, retributions against us by the new government because, you know, my brother was like a communist and a partisan. Although it's not clear why would there be retributions. Right. And he says, like, you know, many nationalist families, uh, like, were treated very badly, but then again, his family wasn't nationalist. It was really right. a communist family. Yes. So I don't know, like, he seems a bit confused there. Uh-huh. Um, so so there are, like, details he, he, the, about this whole period that he doesn't talk about, but we'll hear about it in the premium episode. Um, and uh, so uh, after the liberation of the country and the end of the war, they were moved or, you know, as is of it was the term used in Yugoslavia was colonized uh, to Vojvodina, to the town of Sombor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like the Vojvodina, the, the north of Serbia was, you know, as it was called, colonized by lots of mainly Serbs from other parts of Yugoslavia. So, you know, you know have in that part of Serbia, you have villages of, you know, Montenegrins, Dalmatians, uh, people from other parts of Croatia, Bosnia, yeah. Herzegovina, and so on. Not, not many so, Germans anymore. Weird no, no, they were mostly colonized in uh, the houses and the, vi- the whole villages of Germans that were, you no, know, ex- I'm sure they, they just found a bunch of empty houses there yes. for no reason at all. Yes. Uh, by the way, those Germans will reappear in this story. Oh, yeah? Oh, yes. Okay. Kavaya will meet them. Um, 
And uh, so, uh, yeah, he lived in Sombor, uh, which is a town in, you know, northern Serbia. So as a kid, he, you know, dreamt of be becoming a pilot. And because, you know, his brother Bojo was a kind of a prominent uh, partisan after the war, uh, he was able to enter into the military pilot academy in Pancho near Belgrade. This is now the late 40s, I don't know, 47 or something like this. So okay. he's in pilot school, okay. in the Yugoslav military pilot school, which was a big deal for him. Um, and in 1948, you know, a big historical thing happened. This is the Tito-Stalin split. Yeah. Um, and his family, unfortunately for them, was pro-Stalin, yeah. uh, which meant that they got really fucked very, really badly. Mm -hmm. uh, as we mentioned before, you know, the, the Tito estate really was very paranoid, or maybe rightfully so, about, you know, the possible Soviet invasion after the split with them. And everyone who was kind of pro-Soviet was very suspect. And uh, I think his brothers were very repressed. I think one of them was even killed mm. or something like this. And, but, um, and he says, you know, how you know, the regime was tricky because they would tell them, like, you can, you know, like, say your opinion openly. We are all communists, no problem. And then if you say that you actually support the, the, the Soviet line in this conflict, you would get, you know, very repressed. Mm -hmm. And if right. possibly even sent to the Goli Otok, basically camp that was uh, this horrible island in the Adriatic that was made like a horrible camp, prison, concentration camp, just for uh, mainly for people like this, and where you know the conditions were horrible. Um, and so, uh, but uh, because in he, he was in school, you know, in this pilot academy at the time. And they heard about such cases, so no one in the academy supported the the Stalin line. They were mm -hmm. smart, including Kavaya. Although he says that he was himself influenced by this kind of uh, what what was up to that point a very pro-Soviet Soviet state ideology, and that mm -hmm. he himself he was he says a Russophile, and he says mm -hmm. he was too young to decide between Tito and Stalin. Um, and so on, but he was like a Russophile, but he, you know, figured out what's going on and it's best for him not to say too much. So, you know, early on you, you can see that he's really not an um, ideological anti-communist, or even, I think he, he's becoming one, especially because, you know, his family was repressed so heavily, probably, and he saw things that he didn't like. Um, but the thing was, uh, also, uh, uh, not he's not really a Serbian nationalist at this point, and mm. as we'll see, okay. um, not not a lot of talk mm. about Serbs and Yugoslavia and the position of Serbs in Yugoslavia and so on. This will come later, as we'll see. Uh, okay, so already in 1949, he with a group of pilots uh, is planning to steal some planes and escape and go to the west. Uh, so he gives out some names of these people, and they're not all Serbs, you know, they're Croats, Slovenians there, and they were kind of conspiring together to escape, because they didn't like, you know, the repression, the living conditions, and so on. But nothing came of, the, of this, although some of those people, like him, would later escape on their own, um, and live in the West. Uh, so he finished, you know, uh, school and became an officer in the Yugoslav Air Force. Um, he wanted to be stationed in Batajnica, uh, with, right next to Belgrade, but they sent him to Zagreb, which he didn't like there, and then uh, to his kind of hometown where his family was, to Sombor. Mm. Uh, so he was stationed there. There was like a military airport there uh, and a base. Uh, he, there he found his like old like friend from uh, when he went to school in Sombor, this guy called Sveto Kulusic. And so Sveto was, um, he was a Serb from uh, Croatia whose family was slaughtered by the Ustashas during the Second World War. And he was left, uh, like, you know, like, um, without parents as a, as a child and was kind of adopted by the partisans in Croatia mm -hmm. and became the youngest partisan uh, in that, you know, the particular partisan detachment because he was just a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, at mm -hmm. this point, uh, like Kavaya, he is like pro-Western. He doesn't like what's going on. Although he was raised by, raised by partisans, he doesn't like the new regime. Mm -hmm. And 
he wants something like Western okay. democracy or something like this. So, uh, by the way, now it, uh, this is like where head trauma comes uh, into uh -huh. this uh, story. Uh, while he was stationed in Sombor in the first year, he was uh, they were flying some Soviet plane, like L2 Stormovik is how they called it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kavaya crashed the plane. There was something wrong with the plane, he says, and almost got himself killed and completely busted his head and lost consciousness. Doesn't even remember how he ended up in the hospital. You know, it was pretty fucked up. Um, and he woke up a monarchist? Well, kind of like that. But, <laughs> I mean, his head would get hurt lots more. Um, okay, all right. I think Which he is... was, like, gradually became a monarchist. As, as... He's like a... Like an American yeah. football player here. It's like the yeah. first of many head traumas he'll suffer for yes. the cause. Okay. Yeah. Him and most serial killers, too. Hey, there you go. Well, well he kind of is a serial killer, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when he recovered, he was uh, walking in a park with his, you know, friend Sveto uh, and in Sombor and talking. And so his friend Sveto Kulushi said, like, listen, Nikola, do you want us, like he was very kind of serious and talked quiet, do you want to, us to do something against this communist regime? Mm -hmm. And like, we should do something. It's really unjust and we should kind of try to struggle against it. We'll probably like die or like end up in prison, but I think we need to do it. Um, and Kawai was like very impressed by this and mm. kind of uh, said, yes, let's do it. Um, so the first thing they did was they in their base they made some graffiti uh, during the night and they wrote uh, like s some slogans like down with Tito, down with communism, long live freedom and so on. It okay. was a big deal because this was like a military base in Yugoslavia. You, you had uh -huh, such right. things there. So there was like a big panic. <laughs> um, uh, but they never found them. And so they, for the next action, they decided to do something much uh, bigger than that. And that's to... Uh, to blow up a, like a motor division of the base. As Whoa, he says. that's a pretty big jump. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Damn. But they didn't do it like they were, uh, it was very hard for them because very like well uh, guarded. So they didn't manage to do it. But while they were preparing to do it, someone else did a kind of a similar kind of sabotage in the same base. Okay. So like these huge tanks with gas, gasoline blew up and okay. it was like huge explosions. And uh, never, uh, no one was ever caught, uh, you know, who did that. The, hmm. the guards were suspect, but all, all the guards died in the explosion. So it's Damn. never clear who did it. But they knew that someone else was doing things there. Uh, hmm. They were not the only ones. So in night, this is now 1952. They were transferred to Patanica, the suburb of Bel Belgrade, which okay. is where he wanted to go anyway in the first place. Uh, and they were very happy about this because uh, this was like a a big, uh, the biggest uh, military airport in um, Yugoslavia. There was like a thousand officers and soldiers there. So it was easier for them to continue with their anti-communist activity. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Um, so the, his friend Sveto Kulusic, uh, up to that point, kind of sometimes implied that he's a, a part of a bigger anti-communist organization. Never said mm -hmm. anything uh, um explicitly uh, until this point. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, one day he invited Nikola Kvaya for a meeting, a secret meeting in Zemun, which is, you know, a, a part of Belgrade, historically mm -hmm. a separate town, but then part of Belgrade. So they went there and they met two army officers, uh, a major called Miluti Navramovic and a captain called Janko Shaban. And these two guys uh, told Nikola, listen, we are a part of a secret anti-communist organization of Yugoslav military officers okay. and we want to get rid of this communist regime and have democracy like a western type of democracy here strong uh kind of black hand vibe to that phrase no uh we're yes. a secret yeah. group of Yugoslav military officers sure yes uh i mean uh, it'll be interesting to know more about this like yeah. what was this there's like this is really not uh, research so, and uh, Nikola uh, said yes, although they told him, like, the, you know, the, um, uh, according to our rules, the punishment for uh, betrayal is death. And also he said, like, yes, familiar? I'm, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm fine with that. No problem. <laughs> um, so the first 
the first uh, assignment they got from Major Avramo, which was kind of interesting, they were supposed to go back to their uh, base in Sombor, although they were not stationed there. So the, to go back there and to steal documents from a safe mm-hmm. okay. and bring back to Avramovich. But by the way, Major Avramovich told him, okay, the organization is larger, but I will be your contact. You won't know anyone else except me and this Captain Shaban here, but okay. you know, I will be the contact for the larger organization, but there is one. You know. hmm. Hmm. Uh, so they, this was their first assignment. Did so, they have like know, the they, code or was it just like go and get a safe or blow it up or? No, no, they like, were supposed to steal documents to break but from into a the, safe. Yes. Were they, were they like trained in safe cracking or what no, no, was the I, practical plan here? Uh, you will see the, okay, all right, how, right. how it went. That, that's actually <laughs> highly invested in this. All right. Yes. So, okay. They, they took a train and they went to Sombor and so they were hiding in the cornfields next to the base, which they knew well, you know, they were not only stationed there, they were from Sombor, like right. you know, lived there, went to school there and so on. So, you know, the base was, of course, guarded, but they were kind of knew it. So they waited and then around midnight, they jumped over the fence and, you know, they had their guns like drawn and were walking around the wow. base and they, they found some kind of a back entrance that was not guarded, went into the base found the office of the commissar. The commissar, as I don't know if everyone knows this, it's a kind of a political officer. Yeah. It, uh, it, it comes from, it was basically institution of the Second World War, you know, partisan movement. Every partisan detachment had a, a commissar and a commander. So you, basically every, you know, military group would have, during the war, would have a commander and a commissar, and then there would be a deputy commander and deputy commissar. And the four of them were the leadership of any partisan group, you know. So there was like people uh, in charge of military stuff and people in charge of ideology. Mm-hmm. And so the military kind of continued with that practice uh, after the war. So this base had a political officer, the commissar, and in his office was the safe with these documents that the major Avram Avramovich wanted. Okay. So and you know, commissars go back. I think also the, in the Rus- Russian Revolution, yeah. the Bolsheviks had commissars. Yes, yes, yes. I think the Chinese. Yeah. People's Liberation Army still has commissars. Um, yeah, I heard something about commissars even now in the Russian military. There was some mention of commissars. I don't know what. Oh, well, maybe they brought them back for yeah, whatever. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fucking Nostalgia. ideology they want to the <laughs> promote among the troops now. Yeah, the, the they're the, the commissars of the anti-gay ideology. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you two, <laughs> cut it out. Um, so, uh, yes, as, as Fritz kind of, uh, pointed out, uh, they had the tools to open the safe, but they didn't have, as Kavaya says, they didn't have the experience. So it took them almost three hours to open the safe, but they well, did open it after three hours in all right. this base in the middle of the night. And they stole almost six, uh, kilos of documents, which they mm. put in their military bags and left, uh, on their way back, uh, now they were going like through these villages in north, you know, in Vojvodina, in northern Serbia, uh, from village to village, and they stopped in one village where Kavaya's girlfriend uh, lived near Apatin, uh, called Dobrila Herceg. I will mention her one more time, I think. Uh, so they stayed with her, and uh, Kavaya left the documents with her. They didn't, they didn't want to travel with them back to Belgrade, and she was supposed okay. to deliver the documents a few days. After that, which she did, so that was successful. Um, and on their way back, his friend Sveto Kulusic, who kind of introduced him to this secret organization, told him that Major Avramovich will deliver these documents to a Western intelligence agency. That this was the whole point huh. mm. that he has a contact with a Western intelligence agency. Um, by the way, some other officer in the base uh, got accused for this, um, the stealing of the documents and yeah. got like 15 years of prison. Damn. Something like this. But uh, like that guy was like some communist and Kawai was like, well, you know, he was a communist. He got uh, yeah. repressed by this regime that he supported. And I guess. He was so so this is a real thing. This was my next question. Like, has this been documented anywhere outside of Kavaya's memoirs? I found somewhere that there was an, uh, some people were accused and arrested in Sombor in the 50s, and they were called the uh-huh. Sombor Chetnik group or something like this. Uh-huh. Uh, I remember this years ago that I found it, something like that. So I think it did happen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to 
Because, because with you know Father Kaivich too, I mean his own profile yes. that the FBI said was like prone to like making things up. And so, yes. like, every once in yeah. a while, I'm gonna have to double check and be like, I think hmm. this is like in broad like terms, this is true. But okay, of course, I think many people also. I mean, he wrote this like decades later, so you know he right, can right, be, right. and was an alcoholic and and everything else. So yeah. Um, you can you can kind of s- tell when he's lying or making things up, uh, especially uh-huh. when he writes dialogue and sometimes it's just like <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next mission they got from Major Av- Avramovich was to drop some flyers from the airplane. Um, so uh-huh. and uh, the, he gave them like hundreds of flyers. This was some kind of a um and like invitation to resist the communist regime in Yugoslavia and, you know, kind of pro-democracy in very broad terms, uh, anti-communist, but also not nationalist. There was like nothing Hmm. particularly, I mean, at least not Serbian nationalist. It was Mm -hmm. more kind of Yugoslav. And uh, um, uh, Major Avramovich told him that their secret military organization exists since 1945 and that it was started by the officers who were before in the monarchist army and mm. then became a part of the new army, many of which were people who were not part of the Chetnik movement necessarily, but were kind of um, in uh, camps during the war, uh, German like camps for military prisoners. I and see. then when they were released, they came back to Yugoslavia and became a part of the new army and then didn't like it and they started this. Well, like, kind uh, of like Drashkovich that we talked about, for example. Yes, 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 uh, yes. People that were maybe like arrested at the very beginning of the war or something and just spent the entire war in a camp. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Although it, it's possible that many of them were Chetniks because I think sure. uh, I found in one book that like half of the Chetniks in Serbia uh, switched to partisans uh, like right. uh, at the end of the war. So they became partisans. So it's also possible that, you know, there were actual Chetniks in this organization as well. If mm. listeners are interested in that, we have a couple apps, I think, talking about that back in ARC 2. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, they uh, dropped, uh, you know, hundreds of these flyers on their first, like, night f- uh, action that they had. Like, when they were supposed to flew the, the, uh, the planes, they flew them over, like, three or four major cities in Serbia and j- dropped these flyers. Which, you know, also kind of, somehow, they were not discovered, but, you know, like, anti-communist flyers were dropped uh, about how? major... I, how, how, I was about I to know. say, like, is this where he goes to prison? Because how do you take an airplane, fly it around? I don't know. I mean, you have to, like, fuel up the airplane. I mean, it's not just, like, a simple... I, they, they were flying these planes uh, because they were on, like, some kind of a military assignment, you know. Uh-huh. So they used the, that opportunity to drop the flyers. Still, you'd think well, that then it would you could be just track the their flight path. path. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> but somehow, I don't know. It okay. That's, I mean, it was hard yeah. times, I guess, for the military then, right? This is the fifties. They still hadn't. Yes. Um, this when they were receiving the U.S. aid, military yes. aid. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, so you know, they're just they're just modernizing the air force there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, also maybe they thought like, oh, it must be the Americans. <laughs> it's some liberal freedom shit, you know. Yeah. So, okay, the so first mission for General Amramovich was, you know, steal the documents. The second was drop the flyers. The third one was a bit more hardcore. It was assassinate the commander of the Sombor base. Damn. Um, so it was some General Milan Z- Zrilic who was an obstacle for the secret officer organization in some sense. Uh, so they gave Kavaya some instructions how to kill him uh, and uh, to basically wait for him in next to a road that he uses when he's you know finishes work and drives home so kawaya went there and he actually took some vacation time but instead of going you know to the adriatic he went back to somber <laughs> to hide in a bush next to a road <laughs> with his gun no not a real vacation <laughs> no and he waited there for three nights and the guy never appeared so he went back to, you know, Zemun and met with this uh, Major Avramovich and said, like, what the fuck, the guy never appeared. And Avramovich was like, oh, he might, you know, that, that guy is a fox. He probably kind of um, knew that something was going on. So he just kind of stayed, I don't know, 
took a different road or something like that. He sensed it. Yeah. It was not a big deal for Major Abramovich that Kavaya wasn't able to do that. Weird. Weird, though. That's weird, no? Yeah. Like, if you're, if you're planning an assassination and it doesn't work out, and then the guy who yeah. assigned you to murder somebody to cross this, like, moral and legal boundary is like, meh, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry yes. about it. I mean, l- it wasn't lots that of... Important. Yeah. Uh, I think that Kavaya is a murderer for sure, but, like, lots of his, like, uh, at least the ones that he writes about, his murder plots didn't work out. Like, there's lots of mm-hmm. failure there. Hmm. I don't know, he was, like, smart until the end of his life and didn't write about the sex, successful murders he did. Could be. It's possible. Uh, and kind of skips whole years of his life and what he did. In, and, and also his life in some countries that he lived for years, he doesn't even write about what he did there. Uh-huh, mm. okay. Um, uh, but, yeah. Uh, so, um, at this time, both Kavaya and his friend Kul- Sveta Kulusic wanted to... Their goal was to escape uh, Yugoslavia and to go to the west but uh, Major Avramovich didn't want to hear about it because he needed them in Yugoslavia to do their anti-communist shit there so okay they were like fine we'll do that but in uh, the fall of 1953 things started to change there were mm-hmm. rumors inside the military that there were some officers who deserted and were now basically like underground mm-hmm. um, and so this was like a huge commotion uh, People were kind of confused about what was going on. So Kavaya and Sveta Kulusic wanted this to meet with Major Avramovich. So they went to this Zemun uh, flat where they used to meet with him. And he wasn't there, but this other uh, officer that they uh, met, Captain Shaban, was there. And he was kind of surprised to see them. And it was a very tense situation where they were kind of, everyone was like, had their hands on guns. They were not sure if any one well, of them is a traitor or what's going on. And Chaban then told them that 92 officers were arrested in those days across Yugoslavia. Uh, yeah. Out of that, 30 in the base next to Belgrade. Um, and most of their organization now didn't exist and was arrested. Mm. And that he was kind of surprised to see them not arrested. <laughs> uh, so mm-hmm. at that point, they definitely decided to try to escape Yugoslavia. This was 1953. So they kind of immediately are on the run now. So they want to go to Austria. So they want to go to Slovenia somehow from, you know, Belgrade. Um, And they are like basically train hopping. They are like uh, hopping on like cargo trains where they can. And this is how they travel. Um, Mm. Kind of confused in a state of panic. First, they kind of travel from village to village in northern Serbia, in Vojvodina, which is what they know well. So they stay with, like, girlfriends and friends in, like, different villages there. Um, but they're train then, hopping because they, they're afraid, right, that, that the yes. state's after them, right? Yes, they yes. don't want to be out the, in public. The, the uh-huh. state knows about their involvement because right. most of their organization is arrested now. Right. Um, so at one point, they were in the town of Kula, walking around uh, the streets. Now, they're in uniforms, by the way, Mm -hmm. uh, at night, and they um, uh, kind of suddenly around the corner, they meet uh, like a military patrol, and everyone's kind of confused. So Kavaya uh, uses this confusion and shouts in the patrol, like, why are you pointing that light at us? Or something like this. So the patrol kind of, because he's an officer, the patrol is like, oh, excuse me, whatever, and and goes, you know, and so... uh, Kavaya and his friends are like walking fast and say like, okay, this guy is probably going to figure out that they didn't ideas and they will come back, which is what yeah. happened. Happens. Just and like, then in like the peacemaker. When oh yeah. That Moscow guy tried to yell at the soldier at the checkpoint and they almost uh, got yeah. through, but the checkpoint guy was like, wait a minute, something's fishy here. And then <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 shoot him. Yes. Well, okay. Uh, I think there was no shooting at this point, but they were chasing them around uh, like in the streets of, um, Pula, and they managed to escape and they uh, like stopped a truck driver and they um, went to a village uh, that um, Kavaya knew that he has a friend in and th- th- this hmm. guy was um, also like a military guy but who left the military like two years prior because he was an anti-communist and Kavaya knew this so this guy accepted him in his village house there, kind of didn't ask really questions hmm. um, uh, and just 
let them sleep there for a while. Uh, he even accepted to go to Sombor to visit Kavaya's mother and deliver mm. his letter to her. Um, and then they um, left this uh, this guy's house and kind of were going, you know, from a farm to a farm, sleeping with you know the cattle, kind of avoiding people, getting very filthy in their uniforms, um, and. Uh, they were getting very nervous, and so his friend Sueto had a, like an ear infection. Was mm-hmm. almost like didn't hear anything. Was getting nervous. Well, it's and probably at some from point, fucking all those cows. You know, it's not safe. Probably yes. yes. Hmm. Or you meant and, sleeping uh, with like just sleeping. <laughs> yes. Yes. It gets lonely. Um, so at some point they had like a a fight. Like uh, Sueto got paranoid about Kavaya wanting to like uh, abandon him, so he pointed his gun at. Uh, uh, Nikola Kavaya and Kavaya like you know um, took the gun away from him hit him in the head and then basically kind of arrested his him and was then kind of disgusted by the whole situation and like just gave the gun to Sveta and told him like okay you can shoot me if you want better you than these communists so they made up and they were like oh sorry no I'm sorry and so on uh-huh, so okay. but they were kind of in a bad uh, the morale was very bad so they returned like... to that they returned to that the friend that they just were uh, in his house and this time when he saw them he was like not happy to see them like okay, mm-hmm. again these guys yeah <laughs> actually actually uh when they had that fight uh the gun um ex- uh, accidentally you know shot so like uh, people heard that there was like there was some gunfire uh, which was on a farm nearby where this guy lived. So they went okay. back to his home, <laughs> and he was not happy to see them. Uh, and yeah, he was probably like, these two assholes are going to get me into a bunch of fucking trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. E- exactly, yeah. exactly his mindset. Yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, while they were there kind of explaining what was going on, someone knocks on the door, and these two guys enter, and they were like, just like some local village authorities. And uh, so Kavaya and his friend Sveto take out their guns and they basically take these people as hostages Damn. Jesus. and and tie them <laughs> and are like so their host is like going completely mental and he's like okay i'm, I'm going to prison this is all over you're arresting <laughs> yes. like the local authorities <laughs> this is like fucked he's in deep depression and uh so these people the, the, the these locals tell them like we are here because the villagers saw two officers having a fight and they and shooting at each other <laughs> like and, 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 and they told them like if you are these two officers we just wanted to tell you that you have no right to shoot in our village <laughs> 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 but wait uh wait was he, was he not drinking yet at this point no he wasn't drinking, no wow all that was sober huh Damn. i think so yeah but this is just the tension uh, of being on the run you know it's it's been a yes. couple of days. This is a uh, this is that point in like you know like a road trip movie where they start fighting over some minor shit. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I mean, I've um, been on plenty of road trips where we start fighting over minor shit, but never. yeah, but you're generally not armed on those. Otherwise, you yeah, might have generally no. discharged yeah. a firearm. That yeah, sure. tends to happen. Sure. You know, <laughs> band members are you know they're replaceable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some more than others, I guess. <laughs> Bass players. <laughs> so they go out of this house, and the house is uh, surrounded by uh, the villagers. And they, so they have to go through this mess. So the villagers are kind of not sure what's going on, because they are, you know, military people. So who knows what's going on? Sure. It's not like they want to, you know, stop them or anything. Uh, but everyone's pretty confused. And when they got out of the house, Kavaya remembered that there is, like, some like a, a parliamentary deputy, like a deputy in the Yugoslav parliament living in a house in that village. Um, and he knows this because he, w- with some officers some years prior, he visited him there, which tells me, you know, that Kabaya was kind of well established. Like, uh, you know, he was visiting a member of parliament with some officers. I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. So they go, they go into this house, which he says like is the nicest house in the village or something like this. And they see, you know, they enter the house and they see this member of parliament guy having a dinner and drinking rakia together with some other military officer. So they arrest them, like they take them hostage and they uh, lock them in the cellar of the house and they order his wife to make them something to eat. Oh, God. Um, 
And while they while they are there, the phone uh, you know, rings, and Kavaya <laughs> answers the phone, and he pretends that he's that officer who was there. Uh huh. <laughs> of course. And yes. just and trying who, to make up the guy's voice, like just yeah, just yeah. trying to keep it mad. I cap. swear. <laughs> so the person who's calling is uh, like a state security, like Udba, a major <laughs> called Bubanya, <laughs> who's calling about them. You know, mm-hmm. and he wanted <laughs> Watch to call out. His, these guys yes. are coming. <laughs> <laughs> He's co- wanted to tell to this uh, parliamentary guy that uh, there are these deserters and uh, someone says there were like some shooting among some officers in the city and he thinks it's possibly them. And he what she just, uh, just wanted this guy um, to know about this. And Kalaya pretending to be this officer says, oh yes, they were here, but they went out of the village. They stopped the truck and they went, uh, and he, then he describes the truck and says that they went into some opposite direction of where they are going. So uh-huh. this state security major kind of thanks him. And so Kavaya and his friend thought, like, although they were very miserable, they thought this was, like, very amusing, and they left. Um, so they took some bikes, uh, bicycles uh, from this house, and they continued their trip. Uh, so <laughs> they went... Yeah. Wait, what about the guys in the basement? I mean... They, they were there the whole night, I guess. And then tomorrow they left. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> they can't uh, possibly... I mean, they're on bikes. Like... Yes. So these guys will get out of the basement. They didn't kill them. So they didn't kill them, but they were tied in a basement. So they needed some time to get out. Well, presumably but, the the wife that was untied wife, and it? cooking food for them probably untied them as soon as they left. I guess they could have tied her up before they left. But e- either yep. way, like bikes don't seem like they're fast enough to get away from a crime of that magnitude. No, but, but bikes are actually pretty good for escaping sometimes because you know the people don't really expect you to escape on bike. Some <laughs> successful bank robberies have been pulled off by yeah, dudes on bikes too. You know, that's I mean? like in urban settings, though, not in like the fields. Yeah, in the of middle of no, yeah, 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 you know. Sure, I guess it's pretty yeah. flat there. They can they can cover ground. So can a car. <laughs> this is already wi- winter now, so it's getting cold and it's starting to snow. Oh damn! Um, and they're going into the direction of Croatia now. Um, and uh, in I think December of 1953, they managed to get to the outskirts of Zagreb mm. using bicycles, stopping truck drivers, and like also train hopping and such things. They managed to get somehow near Zagreb, and then um, Kavaya remembers that he has another friend who's an active military officer living in Zagreb. So they visit this guy who also accepts them quite, you know in a very friendly way and uh, buys lots of food for them and gives them everything they need. So they stayed for a few days and nights there. Um, And this guy actually decides to join them uh, Hmm. and to Hmm. try to escape Yugoslavia with them. So he calls his military base and says that he's sick, that he can't come to the the base. And he just uh, tries to escape uh, with them to Austria. And uh, he found, the, the, their host in Zagreb found some truck driver to take them, uh, but only like a small part of their journey. Uh, I think they, they didn't even reach Slovenia, I think, by that point. But so their goal was to reach Maribor, the, for now, the, Maribor is the second largest city in Slovenia. Yeah, lovely place. They're freezing because it's snowing, it's December, they're very tired. They're basically on on foot traveling. Um, So they find like a German bunker from the war and they hide in it. And their friend from Zagreb um, is going to go out and scout a little bit. If maybe there is some train that they can catch, that they can take them to Maribor. But while he's doing that, he runs into another military patrol. But this time they're shooting and their friend shoots uh, like a, a soldier. And wounds him and is arrested. So the, only the two of them are now continuing their journey. Uh, and uh, they manage to reach uh, Maribor at some point. Uh, I don't know how many weeks it uh, took them. But they were hiding uh, during the day in like some small uh, foresty area outside of the city. Waiting for the night. And b- because they, were, they had their military uniforms but they were very dirty. Uh, so they wanted, you know, not everyone to see them very clearly. So right. during the evening, they went into the town and they found like a, some restaurant, bar, and uh, went in there 
uh, in the dark area of the bar and kind of had some food, arrested a little bit. They were also worried because they were had like Air Force uniforms and there were no Air Force, there was no Air Force in Maribor. So that was, could also be very suspicious to people. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one uh, really noticed. And then they continued their travel to the border with Austria, again, sleeping on farms and so on. And now they were 20 kilometers. They, they walked for more 20 kilometers, you know, from Maribor, and they were pretty close now to the border. Kavaya had some binoculars and he could see uh, Austria uh, now. So they were very close. Hmm. It was snowing uh, and, you know, uh, they were walking mostly in the night. And there was like, in that particular night, it is, this was, I think, the 14th of December, now 1953, there was like uh, lots of moonlight so they could see uh, pretty clearly and they saw in the snow they saw the footsteps of the border um, uh, military uh, mm -hmm. patrols uh, sure um and so they knew they were like basically on the border um so they walked very uh, you know carefully with their guns in their hands they also had like automatic weapons with them not only handguns but also like Damn. some machine guns and so on uh, and they were walking very, you know, uh, carefully. And at some point they just hear, you know, stop. And, you know, it's the border guards. And there was like basically a battle. Uh, so the the border guards are shooting from automatic weapons on them. And Kalaya is throwing bombs that he had. Oh, damn. And had grenades and shit. <laughs> they had grenades, yes. <laughs> and so yeah. everyone, is, everyone is shooting from machine guns now. Um, oh, shit. And they manage somehow to stay alive there by throwing two or three bombs uh, at the border guards. And, but they back away from the border and they run some two kilometers now inside of Yugoslavia back and hide somewhere. Uh, along the way, they, they threw away their like machine guns. Now only they had like only well, like guns with, you know, six bullets or something like this, each of them. Um, by the way, they killed two or three of these uh, soldiers Damn. at that point, which they didn't know at that point, but they did. Um, yeah, man, when so, you're chucking grenades around, that tends to, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's not healthy. Yeah. So they wait somewhere in some forest, and tomorrow they decide to try again. So they again reach the border and are again uh, confronted by the border guards, but this time they are arrested. And uh, but at some point, Out of while grenades. being yes, but uh, while you know being arrested, um, Kavaya very like uh, does like some fast move. It take, takes his gun out and points it to the like one of the soldiers' heads and pulls okay. the trigger, but it, it didn't fire. Oh. Um, and at that point, everyone of the all the soldiers started hitting Kavaya in his head <laughs> again. Um, yeah, okay. so, so, see, so he passes out and wakes up um, in like a base near uh, the border uh, with like his head was he, like very, it hurt a lot, you know, he yeah, was I very uh, bleeding and so on. This, um, this is just running so much like, uh, like a a D and D adventure. I mean, he starts out. He's like a normal kind of guy. He ends up finding a companion. They they decide that they're kind of, you know, they relate to each other. Then he gets a mission from a secretive organization, which starts like yes. the hero's journey process. Uh, he decides, <laughs> yes. much like you guys did during our RPG adventure, to be murder hobos and just starts fucking tying <laughs> people up and wow. like like attacking people on site <laughs> you know he picks up more companions goes to a key battle uh where obviously he levels up through another head injury and now he clearly will have more powers and abilities uh, yes yes exactly well oh yes we have a similar style of playing i guess <laughs> yes that's definitely true mm -hmm. yes kavaya the murder hobo um so He's interrogated by some officer uh, at that uh, base. And for some reason, this officer takes the gun from um, Kavaya and shoots it twice into the ceiling, uh, which is something that will save Kavaya's life, as you will see, hmm. uh, at least according to Kavaya. Although okay. Kavaya was now you know, completely defeated uh, and you know, 
he did it, none of this. It was a complete failure. He also felt very relieved uh, and kind of nice. He says, uh, kind of the stress was gone. Okay, we were arrested. Now I can I can relax. And also, he was not that so. That might cold also be the head anymore. injury. Yeah, maybe yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So now they are back in Maribor, um, tied up in a in a cellar of some military building and um, in like isolation um interrogated at some point they tell them they will lynch them that everyone is going oh. to lynch them all the soldiers in the base which kavaya says did happen in those years hmm. but ah. um they take him uh, both of them they uh, took them to the yard of the military base and tied them to like a pole there uh, and then gathered all the army oh, there and yeah. but they told them like don't hurt them you you should just spit on them so the whole base was spitting on them yeah yeah um that's kind of like um well yeah they didn't they didn't hurt him but there's that uh the british navy did some shit like that right that yeah the, the huh. flogging flogging around the fleet and, and stuff like that yeah mm. uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> although flogging around the fleet i think was like across the whole fleet and they'd like keep you alive and you know Damn. <laughs> lots of guys well this is just spitting i mean it's it's you know it's a symbolic firing it's like a pie yeah. assassination Yes. It maintains group cohesion to have them... Group you know, cohesion, yeah. Beat up a traitor who, you know, or spit on a traitor, at least. I could spit on a traitor. I'm sure a couple... I'm sure some got a couple blows in. Yeah, sure. So, um, they were interrogated there. By the way, when they stole those documents for Major Avramovich from the base in Sombor, Kavaya didn't... Uh, uh, give all six kilos of documents to Avramovich, he also kept some of them for himself, and now they found it on him, uh, these documents, which could tie him to the break-in into that base as well. Uh, but uh, while he was interrogated like by some particular officer in Maribor who was kind of sleepy, didn't pay attention while interrogating Kavaya, Kavaya actually managed, because he was in the office with that interrogator together with all the evidence, and there was a furnace there used for heating. So Kavaya managed to take those documents in front of that officer and just burn them. Um, so he basically destroyed some evidence that could use, be used against him in the court. Although hmm. they, had, like, they had a list of everything they found on him, so those documents were on the list, but they didn't have the documents. So hmm. that's also something that was like, used for him, for him later during the trial. Um, but I mean, wouldn't you imagine that the trial would, if they said like, okay, we have it on the list, we saw him burn it. They I didn't mean, saw him burn it. Ah, okay. The, so the documents for all mm -hmm. they know just went missing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so months were passing now and they didn't really cooperate with the interrogators. They were trying to find out if they were... Uh, uh, in contact with this Major Avramovich guy, and if they were part of this organization, they didn't want to admit anything. So because the, they couldn't handle them, they transferred them now back to Kula. So we are going all, all the way back. Like they were all, uh, you know, they were both in Maribor and in Kula. Uh, they went through all of these towns, and they are now going back, but as prisoners of various agencies in Yugoslavia. So in Kula, there is like the the a base, which is not a military base, but a base of the state security of Udba. Uh -huh. sure. And uh, they were uh, going to be interrogated there in very harsh conditions because the military couldn't break them. And fa I found that interesting because Kula, much later, would be also the headquarters of the Red Berets yeah. mm, the, that we talked about. In, That's, uh, um, the, yeah. yeah, there's the famous uh, Legia burning down the nightclub. In yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, they are there in the fifty three, and the 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 guy who's you know the 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 main guy at the base is that Major Bubanya, who was the guy who Kavaya tricked when he answered the phone and pretended uh -huh. to be the officer when they kidnapped. Uh, they you know they took hostage the the parliamentary deputy and uh, tied him up in the cellar and so on. So this guy Bubanya is really you know um, wants to completely fuck with them. And, Especially because he knew Kavaya from before, because the, hmm. the, this town is close to Sombor, where uh, Kavaya was stationed uh, as a pilot. So he knew him from before and kind of kept his eye on him 
because Kawaya was in a relationship with that girl that I mentioned before, Dubila Herceg. Mm-hmm. And this major Bubonya was telling uh, Kawaya, like, you better watch out because, you know, Dobrila, she's from a, like a Kulak family, like a mm. family of like kind of wealthy uh, farmers who are like not communists or something like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he kind of knew him from before. Now, this is now already the winter of 1954. So okay. a year has passed since they tried to uh, cross the border. And the... The conditions in this Udba or state security prison are horrible. So they, he sleeps on a floor in a like a concrete cell with no light, and they took away the mattress that was on the floor. So he has only uh, uh, the concrete to sleep on it. Um, the food is almost none, and it's horrible. He has uh, handcuffs all the time, except when he eats. And they, you know, ex- especially tight, so it hurts. Um, he has a bottle of... It's winter, there's no heating. So he has like a bottle of water, but the water is frozen. And so because he he can, you know, lay down on the frozen concrete. So he has some pot to shit and piss in. So the whole night he's sitting on it. That's how he's, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. he's spending his time. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty horrible there. Uh, it's It's some... Um, point is major bubanya is kind of interrogating him in front of all the officers uh in the base and kind of making fun of him humiliating him and so on and uh he can the so the bubanya kind of dictates uh kavaya's confession and gives uh it to kavaya to sign it which kavaya refuses and uh he tears up the uh paper and throws throws it at bubanya uh, which makes Bubanya very ba- uh, mad, and Bubanya starts hitting Kavaya in the head, which uh, Ka- Kavaya, you know, number three. Uh, yes, Kavaya returns the uh, some with some aggression towards Bubanya, and then all the officers just beat up uh, uh, Kavaya until he's unconscious um, and doesn't remember how you know where he was when he woke up and so on. So these, he these group trying. ass beatings are, seem to be yes. a little trend there for him. I yes. feel like they're trying to make a serial killer out of this man. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so there is some kind of confrontation with witnesses here. Although this is not a trial, but I don't know what Udba was doing. But so they bring people there. like who. So, for example, that parliamentary deputy is there. So he's shouting, he de- like he says how they should be killed on the spot right there uh, and such things. So Kavaya's friend Sveto Kulusic replies something um, arrogantly, I guess, to the parliamentary deputy, which gets the parliamentary deputy very angry. So he starts strangling um, Kavaya's friend and spitting on him and slapping him around like during this interrogation. And Kavaya says something. I just had yes. like the, the Homer Simpson choking Bart like image in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it just yeah. popped in there. Yeah. So at some point, uh, while in this state security prison, Kavaya is not alone in the cell. They put a new prisoner with him, who is a guy who, who was one of these pro inform bureau resolution guys. So let's say pro Soviet Union, a Stalinist, mm-hmm. an army officer who was arrested because of that. And Kavaya starts, like, persuading him that they should escape. And this guy says, like, well, Nikola, how can we escape? You're for the Americans, I'm from the Russians. Like, we're completely the opposite. <laughs> and Kavaya's like, no, it doesn't matter. We can escape now, and then, you know, we can go our own. Each can go his own way. And But um, uh, all of a sudden, one morning, uh, like, a state security officer uh, bursts into, into his cell with a gun and says, like, Nikola Kawaya, I'm arresting you. And Kawaya's like, well, I'm in a prison. Like, what are you yeah, talking about? Yeah, I'm already about? arrested, yeah. Yes. But he, he realized that this guy kind of ratted him out, the, the, the Stalinist guy, ratted uh-huh. him out to state security mm-hmm. about his idea to escape. So okay. now, that when you're arrested in, you know, in a prison, they take you to a different prison. So they are now taking him to even a worse place, which is some farm they took away from some farmer who was, I guess, a kulak as they said. Mm. So they keep him in a cellar of that farm in complete dark for two and a half months. Damn. Um, when, he, when he went to the uh, farm 
first thing they did was like this, some major Salai just approached him and hit him with his gun on his head. Uh, Four. Which, at that point, he fainted um, and woke up uh, in this dark cellar where he spent his two and a half months up there. Fucking Christ. Yeah. Uh, at that point, he heard from someone that his friend Sveto Kulusic died. The guy who tried to escape uh-huh. with him. The, the partisan kid who, who grew up in the partisans was dead at this point. Because he was mm. already sick. He had his ear infection that at some point started bleeding. And, mm. you know, he died. Um, so after the um, state security couldn't break him, he was back in a military prison. This time in Ljubljana. Uh, this is all before trial. Uh, so, by the way, this is like uh, a prison in Metelkova number two, uh, mm. <laughs> which is where the uh, the squat is today, and Ljubljana, the, yeah. even the an- anarchy, like a former barracks where the anarchists even have a, a, a place there, an info shop. But yeah, this is where a place to see shows too. In, in Ljubljana. Yes. Yeah. So this is one of the places where Kawaii was held. Damn. But this was like now for him, this was like heaven. Like after the security, state security prison, this was like great. Got to see some concerts, <laughs> yes. check out the distro. <laughs> yes. And yeah. uh, for this and other reasons that I'll mention soon, I think um, like Kavaya obviously has some like a, a soft spot for Slovenians. He likes mm-hmm. them. Okay. Uh, so, Unlike Ray. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm trying to propagate this myth here on the show. I think yeah. it's working. So he was uh, under investigation in this prison for, um, I think, maybe a year or year and a half in Ljubljana now, before trial. So he had a nice cell, he says, like it was four by two meters. He had a nice, um, comfortable bed. Um, he had three meals with good food. Per day, uh, he was able to take a shower with hot water once per week. He was able to have a walk for an hour every day. So for him, this was like very, very good. Mm. Um, And uh, in 1955 of April, uh, while in this prison, he met his interrogators. It was like one Slovenian officer and one Serbian, I guess. Uh, The Slovenian was called Major Tros. And he liked them. He was very impressed by them. He says they were they were very nice. No one was hitting him with their guns in his uh, to his head and so on. Oh. They were even kind of polite. Um, and he said he was treated correctly by them, uh, like in a good way. Um, so K- Kavaya's strategy was that uh, he didn't uh, participate in the first attempt to cross the border on the fourteenth. Uh, Only the, the second one on the fifteenth. The- so the one where the not, people died, it wasn't him, he's going to say. And it wasn't him when he uh-huh. was throwing bombs and so on. Because yes. uh, it was a big commotion and none of the guards could recognize him. So none mm. of the guards could actually, no one lied that they knew that it, it, it was him. Um, mm-hmm. They also got rid of their machine guns. Uh, they threw it into a river uh, before they were arrested. And, and the gun that he had when he was arrested the military, the officer shot into the ceiling twice, and for that reason, they couldn't prove that the, the that gun was used in that uh, before that somehow. I don't know. Hmm. Um, cool. And and anyway, all of these guns were very standard military equipment that many many people had in Yugoslavia, so they couldn't somehow um, prove that the particular gun that Kavaya had was used in that attack, uh, according to Kavaya. Um, Anyway, that was his strategy. Um, so uh, when the trial was about to start, uh, this, his, this interrogator, the Slovenian guy, even kind of recommended to Kavaya to take a, like a military lawyer. And he um, uh, recommended one. It was the Captain Anička Azno. And Kavaya listened to him and took this Anička to be his lawyer and was also very satisfied. Obviously, this was a, some Slovenian woman like a military uh, person, but a lawyer. And she was very, uh, Kavai was also very satisfied with her as well, how she defended him in court and everything. Um, but uh, when the trial started uh, a year later, uh, of course, you know, he was found guilty, but still he was, he didn't get the death sentence, which was very, you know, likely. Mm-hmm. They, the, the, the proof they had wasn't actually good enough for that. So he okay. got 18 years of uh, 
prison. That was his sentence. Which is, you know, considering that he killed two or three soldiers and, you know, this is the Yugoslavia you know, in its totalitarian era and so on. Yeah. You know. I mean, I don't want to say he necessarily got off easy either. <laughs> no, no. that was a pretty rough ride there. I mean, but he did but also yeah. kind of fuck around and he found out. He, mean, yes. <laughs> yes. Like he yes. That's what they said to him at the end of the trial. <laughs> yes. Comrade Kavaya, you fuck around. You found out. You found out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sleep in this Kulak cellar for fucking two months. And God damn. Yes. Catch a beating from a bunch of guys. But it, it's also possible that they didn't expect him to live uh, the entirety of his uh, prison sentence, which, which we'll see why I think this. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, so now he was transferred to a prison, because this is now post-trial, back to Maribor again. So he was in the cell 143, and right next to him was cell 142, and this was the cell where Tito served his um, prison sentence in the 30s, mm. which Kawaya makes note of. Um uh, it was not horrible in this prison, according to him. Uh, he, they worked and like they were making furniture, but they were like not very motivated to work. Were very lazy and undisciplined. But they said that the, the prison administration didn't really press them too much to work very hard. So the discipline got very bad at some point, and they were like using all kind of machinery. So I mean, this is kind of uh, this. Uh, uh, escalates pretty quickly you know the discipline was uh pretty bad and then one guy accidentally uh decapitated himself uh, oh. with, uh with some guillotine that they had there for some reason uh what <laughs> yes yeah, a guillotine uh, or like a or like a bandsaw or something that you would use. well he says guillotine i doubt it's an actual guillotine but he's that's what he says Oh, okay, yeah, he's the, old, the old guillotine for making, you know, chairs. Oh. It's just, well, <laughs> very practical. Come on, he's not a carpenter, okay? He, he <laughs> yeah, makes a guillotine. Like, clearly not. <laughs> it was probably like a circular saw. Yeah, it was, it was a bandsaw, and he's just like, you know. Uh, his his Either trauma-addled way. brain is just like, oh, yes. <laughs> guillotine. Oh, man. Like the cutting thing. Although that thing. that is that is the worst head injury of the story yet. Uh, uh yes, yeah, definitely. But it wasn't Kavaya. Yeah, I think he was. So, yes, at least. he dodged. That. Unfortunately, um, I mean, that yeah. would have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are now in 1957. Kavaya spent four years in this prison in Maribor. Um, you know, we're now in 1957. Um, so how old is Kavaya now? He's born in. So he's like 23, 24. Man, Very young. Still really young, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he basically, what do they say? Your brain develops until you're 23 or something like that. Not so, his, man. Yeah. Not if, I mean, you, you need yeah. space for that, you know? <laughs> yes. that, that's yeah. assuming you're not getting smashed in the head constantly for that time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I think his brain just spent that time recovering. And um, so in 1957, Moshe Piade died. Mm. Moshe Piade was at that point, like, I think the vice president of Yugoslavia or something like this. He was an old communist, like a Jewish guy from Belgrade, who uh, was an important guy. And he's the guy for, who translated Das Kapital to Serbo Croatian while in prison in, in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And when he died, uh, because these prisoners here were anti communist, or like, some were anti communist, but all of them were anti Titoists, because they were mm -hmm. also like pro Soviet people there as well. Right. Uh, and most of them were military. There was even a general there who was in prison. <laughs> Hates generals. He woke up and started fighting. <laughs> uh, so uh, the prisoners were celebrating the death of Moshe Piade, and they were shouting something like, today Moshe, tomorrow Tito, or something like this. And then this escalated into a riot. Uh, they were burning uh, the furniture they were making, so there was like a fire, and it was like pretty serious. Whoa. At some point, the military surrounded the prison and there was all, some kind of negotiation and they had demands and they wanted some kind of federal inspection to come into prison to see <laughs> Just what... Just to remove the guillotine. <laughs> yes, like, to check the conditions <laughs> they had and so on. And actually, some, uh, they got some of this and some, some officials from the prison were removed from the hmm. prison. So it okay. had some kind of effect. But after that, the kind of the organizers of this riot and strike were heavily repressed. They spent three months in isolation. Mm. Kawaii was one of them. Uh, but uh, 
the time that he spent in this prison was very important for Kawaya because he met a, 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 a very good friend at that point. And he wanted, it was a Slovenian guy again, and he wanted to meet a Slovenian because he was already planning to escape. And he was in prison in Slovenia, so he wanted a local guy who knows the terrain. Sure. And, and he, so he met this Viktor Persh guy, and it was even better because Viktor also knew uh, as uh, uh, also knew German as well as he did Slovenian, and which was very useful because he wanted to escape to Austria. Mm-hmm. Um, Viktor Persh was uh, also an ex-military guy who who was actually in the old monarchist, I think, military, uh, and was kind of like we mentioned already in these kind of internment camps during the war. Right. And, and but then, cho- although he was not a communist, he chose to come back to Yugoslavia after the war. And I don't know what he did, actually, why he was in prison, but he was an anti-communist. Um, and they became friends um, and started uh, conspiring uh, somehow how to escape together. And what was the trigger for them actually trying to escape was that they were about to be transferred to Goliotok, oh. um, which, you know, I mentioned before that basically the concentration camp uh, made mainly for um, pro-Soviet uh, communists, but not only for them, obviously, yeah. uh, for kind of the worst uh, prisoners, uh, uh, according to the state at that point. So they wanted to transfer both Victor and Kavaya there, and which they thought was their kind of death sentence, that especially with the long sentences they had, that they wouldn't survive that, yeah, and, which was probably true. And the, the conditions there were brutal, and not yeah. only conditions, it was also like just physical and psychological humiliation that the prisoners went through there. It was quite, uh, quite bad. Um, so they were transferred, they were supposed to be transferred there uh, by a train and they boarded a train and during the night uh, or when everyone was sleeping, or the, most of the prisoners and, and the guards were kind of not so alert, uh, when Victor thought it was a good time because you remember he's a local Slovenian guy to escape. He gave a signal to Kavaya and Kavaya stood up and just uh, with all his strength uh, hit um, one of the guards to, in, in his head. I think maybe the guy kind of flew away and, um, and then uh, broke the window of a train and then they both of them jumped through the broken glass Damn. Um, outside of a prison. This was the on the seventh uh, outside of the train. train uh-huh. uh, this was the seventeenth of August, nineteen fifty-seven. Uh, so they were did quite. It, did fu- it explode in slow motion behind them? N- it didn't. No, it just. Oh. It, it went away, but they were pretty fucked up in bad condition after this. Mm. Um, and it, but the unlike the previous attempt, now he had a Slovenian guy there who was a local who who knew where they were and how the things. And even better, he had family on the Austrian side uh, part uh, of the mm. border because, you know, these border areas of Austria had l- lots of Slovenian population there and he had like an aunt and uncle or something and a cousin living there. Yeah. So they had actually no problem uh, crossing the border this time. So they escaped from the train on the 17th of August and the 21st of August they were already uh, in Austria. Although Kawai mm. was, you know, very traumatized by the previous years, and he was kind of afraid to, even though they were pretty sure they were in Austria, Kavaya decided just to hide somewhere, or like, and let uh, Victor go and find his the village of his family and come back to him when he's 100% sure that they are, in fact, in Austria. Hmm. Okay. Which, Victor, which Victor did. And he found Kavaya hiding somewhere in some cave or somewhere and, like, and took him to his family uh, to his fam, like relatives' house, which was like a village house, like a Slovenian village house in Austria, and he, Kavaya, you know, was very happy. He was treated very well by those people. Uh, he got new clothes. They finally had civilian clothes after many years. He didn't have a uniform anymore, and uh, got food, and you know, everything was well. Um, so I think this is also a part why he loves Slovenians so much. Sure, but oh. Uh, so, but, you know, compare this to how, you know, Father Kajevic um, escaped Yugoslavia. Right. Um, you mean he just left? <laughs> yes. Yes. He, <laughs> he took a train next to the border and then walked over the... <laughs> yes. Uh, the, yeah. Yes. 
So, okay, well, that was, you know, 63. Okay, the situation was a bit different in 63 than it was in 53 yeah. in Yugoslavia. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. And all uh, Kavaya's got to do is avoid the urge to wrestle the next person that gives him a ride. And he's yes. good. So, uh, now uh, they took a train and they went for Salzburg, which is a very important place for Kavaya uh, in the next few years uh, before he goes to America. Well, I like that's a good place to stop. Sure, he's out. I feel relieved. That's mm. good. Uh, I know that I shouldn't because I know what's gonna happen. Who he's gonna become? Yes. But it also, I think, this says a lot about probably why he was that way. Maybe it does. Maybe. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, okay. I Can mean, we not try we... to frame this in some sort of Kavaya sympathy bullshit. No, no, no. We should. I mean, people are people. Like uh, oh, they come from that. somewhere. You know, <laughs> they people come from traumatic situations and they they inflict those traumas onto other people. They're not born I mean, evil. <laughs> I don't think know? this is no. like I. I don't have a, like a pro Kavaya sentiment at all. He's kind of a psycho killer, literally. And, yes. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, I just I'm I'm also not like in this story. I'm also kind of n- not pro people who are against him. Like yeah. because this is like you can see clearly how you know that system kind of made some people into their enemies who probably originally were not the enemies. You know. For example, his friend, who was basically adopted by the partisans, uh, was not probably not like, uh, you know, if they didn't see some things that they saw, they wouldn't be anti-Titoist or anti-communist. Um, you know, especially in these early days, like late 40s, early 50s, there was a pretty harsh repression. And I think, you know, in, uh, antagonized some people. And, not, uh, and most people they antagonized were not, actually people like Kavaya. There was very few people like Kavaya, but there was many communists who were antagonized, you know, and right. who were then kind of declared to be Stalinists, although I don't think many of these people were not Stalinists. Maybe many of them were pro-Soviet, but, you know, they were not more Stalinist than Tito was Stalinist. I mean, in some way, they were all, in some way, Stalinist. Stalinist, but yeah. It's not like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, these people were not like pro-repression. They just believed, you know, the, in the Soviet Union because everyone did up to that point. Uh, so I don't know. Um, yes, definitely not pro Kavaya, but also kind of anti horrible repression, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, th- th- those feelings will subside, I think, in the next couple episodes. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, God, four head yeah. injuries in a few solitary confinements, a lot of spitting. It's been, uh, yeah. it's, it's been quite a journey. It's been a wet, wet journey. <laughs> yes. So, yes, okay, originally I wanted this only to be a half of the episode, but uh, as we see clearly now, it, this will have to be two episodes. The, the story that I prepared for today will have to be split into two. So we'll stop here. The, so this episode was, you know, the whole episode was basically Kavar trying to escape. Yeah. Yugoslavia, and now he finally escaped. He's finally a part of the diaspora. And he is now. Yes, he is now in right. Salzburg. Yeah. And so I can't a, hop in, a hop in place for them. And th- this this will be a very important place for him, as you'll see. This is like he he will make connections in Salzburg that will last uh, while he uh, lived in America later on. Hmm. 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 Okay. Man. Yeah. Very interesting. You know, it's uh, clearly judging by the length of this episode um it it doesn't rise to the level of importance as the film termination man and diplomatic siege which of course (laughs) we had to spend over two hours on yeah i think it's good that we're you know we're sensitive to that yeah (laughs) doing a normal length (laughs) it takes a swing (laughs) yes (laughs) yes yeah Yeah. wow man what a story i can't wait for the next one uh let's do it tomorrow Mm -mm. no (laughs) nobody okay I mean, I don't know. Did you mention that that, the... that's not going to be recorded, right? That's <laughs> that's for us, uh, right? It's for anybody. It's for anybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for the people riveted to their seats now. Um, uh, yeah, cool. And what's next? Then we're going to do some. Uh, we're going to we're going to give an interview, or we're going to rather recite an interview, aren't we? Yes, we'll do a couple a, of things. A, a reenactment of an interview Kavaya did with a British journalist. Yeah. Uh, much later on, but he talked about some of the things that we went through now. But he yeah. he talks about them in a different way. 
He also will talk about some things that we'll discuss in the next episode, um, the next free episode about Kawaii and the one after that as well. Yeah, there you go. Mm. And as I recall, uh, if the listener is also currently um, feeling some sympathies towards our friend Kavaya here, that interview might help clear some things up for you there. Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that's for the patrons. So the rest of you will see you next week. All right. Yes. All right. Later, boysies. Later. Bye. Fritz here from The Empire Never Ended. This has been one of our weekly free episodes for free people. But for premium people, we also have weekly premium episodes, which you can get at patreon.com slash tenepod, T-E-N-E-P-O-D. And also follow our various social media things in the, in the show description there. Like and subscribe them. Follow them. Like and sub- follow and subscribe and follow them. Do it.